Hello everyone. This is a new video which uh, includes discussions on respiratory support in acute exacerbation of COPD. So I'll first start off with a case and uh, then I will talk about hypercapnia and how to diagnose hypercapnia, what are the complications of hypercapnia. And I would follow it up with a, a discussion on how to provide oxygen therapy in these cases and when to go for an IV and when to provide mechanical ventilation. So without further ado, let's uh, discuss this very important topic in detail. So this is our case. A 65-year-old man with COPD presents with a history of shortness of breath for last one day. There is also history of increasing cough, productive of buccoid sputum, wheezing, and a low-grade fever for the last three days. Vitals reveal tachypnea, tachycardia, a raised temperature, and the saturation is low. Auscultation reveals typical finding of COPD. So the patient was diagnosed the case of acute exacerbation of COPD and started on typical medications including nebulized bronchodilators, systemic corticosteroids, high flow facial mask oxygen and antibiotics. But 30 minutes later, he is lethargic and confused. So, what's happening? The patient actually developed carbon dioxide retention, which is also known as hypercapnia or hypercarbia. And as the patient has CNS symptoms, we can also call it by the name of carbon dioxide narcosis. There are a few early features of diagnosing this condition, um, which actually happens due to the effect of carbon dioxide on the vascular system. Carbon dioxide causes vasodilation in both the peripheral vessels and the cerebral vessels. And peripheral vasodilation increases the blood supply, so there would be warm periphery and the pulses will be pounding. There can also be flattened tremor and phytoscopy might reveal papilloedema. And as there are cerebral vasodilation, there will be increase in cerebral blood flow, which causes a raised intracranial pressure. And this leads to a depressed level of consciousness and sometimes seizure. There's also dysfunction of heart and sometimes a chance of having arrhythmias. Before going to the management, let's talk about the basic mechanism behind uh, development of hypercarbia in this patient who has received a high dose of oxygen via facial mask. From our basic physiological learning, we know that hypoxia and hypercarbia both are stimulator of respiratory center, or you can say both of them drives the respiratory center. In patients who have Chronic COPD, which is moderately severe, they have concomitant hypoxia and hypercarbia, which is termed as type 2 respiratory failure. As the hypercapnia is present for a long time, the respiratory centers become insensitive to hypercapnia. They only rely or depend on hypoxia as their stimulator. But when we provide a high flow oxygen in such patient, then their partial pressure of oxygen suddenly increases, which leads to a loss of this hypoxic respiratory drive. This is the main reason behind uh, increasing the level of hypercapnia as the patient does not breathe often and does not uh, breathe deeply. So the rate and the depth both decreases leading to retention of carbon dioxide causing hypercapnia. There are other additional mechanisms, including an increase in dead space ventilation and Halden effect. We know 
that oxygen is a vasodilator in the pulmonary circulation. So whenever we provide a high dose of oxygen, this causes vasodilation throughout the lungs, both of the lungs. And in case of COPD, there are some regions of the lung who, which does not have proper ventilation, but still happens to have vasodilation. So the blood is directed or distributed to all the areas. Doesn't matter if it's, if it's well ventilated or poorly ventilated. So this redistribution of blood to poorly ventilated regions actually increases the chance of having hypercapnia due to decrease in excretion of carbon dioxide. There is also another effect which is physiological effect. And we know that oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin have different affinity for carbon dioxide. Normally, the deoxygenated hemoglobin has a high affinity for carbon dioxide, but the oxygenated hemoglobin generally releases carbon dioxide so it does not transport carbon dioxide as well so whenever we provide a high dose of oxygen this leads to an increase in oxyhemoglobin level throughout the system throughout the tissues so as there is a high level of carbon dioxide but there is not enough high level there is not enough deoxyhemoglobin then those carbon dioxide cannot be transported back to the lungs to be excreted in the air so they are trapped in the tissues and this leads to exacerbation of hypercapnia so what should you do we should follow some principles in any patients we should start with a low flow of oxygen and if we suspect the patient as having early signs of carbon dioxide retention then we must keep the oxygen flow up to 2 liters or 28%, not more than that. And if there is no evidence of retention, we'd still be cautious and go up to a level of 40% FiO2, which corresponds to roughly 4 to 5 liters of oxygen per minute. And after starting our oxygen therapy, we should do an ABG within an hour to estimate our uh, treatment response. And the response aim is to raise the partial pressure of oxygen above 8 kilopascal, which corresponds roughly to 60 millimeters of mercury, and at least 7 kilopascal or 52 millimeters of mercury, because we know that severe hypoxia damages multiple structures, including brain. So there is ischemic brain damage, and there is also high risk of arrhythmia. But our goal should also focus on carbon dioxide and we should not increase the carbon dioxide more than 1.5 kilopascal which is around 11 millimeters of mercury and our saturation aim which is monitored uh, frequently would be 88 to 92 percent and we can go up to 94 percent but not more than that before because if we go beyond that it will exacerbate the hypercapnia and if we have to provide oxygen for a long time, we should add water to the oxygen supplying system. So we have to, we have to humidify. And there are multiple ways of administering oxygen, including nasal cannula, simple face mask, and venturi mask. Nasal cannula and simple face mask have uh, certain disadvantages because both of them are imprecise and their flow rate are low. And one specific disadvantage of simple face mask is it has a propensity of increasing the hypercapnia. Venturi mask is one of the best options for a non-invasive and uh, non-invasive way of providing oxygen because they provide a precise percentage or a precise fraction at high flow rates. And as you know, it has multiple colors for multiple levels of flow. Here is a venturi mask with the flow connectors or flow regulators around them. So it has multiple colors, which is coded for the flow rates. There are other ways that we have to uh, focus on, which are correction of anemia, improvement of cardiac output, and chest physiotherapy. All of them improves oxygenation in the tissues. But 
if uh, the patient does not respond to our initial oxygen management along with the nebulizers and steroid, we should check the ABG and we should go for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation if required. There are some criteria, including the respiratory rate, which should be more than 30 breaths per minute. The pH should be less than 7.35, meaning that there should be some respiratory acidosis, which happens due to a rising partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And uh, there are some preconditions of using non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which are the patient must be very cooperative and they should be able to protect their airway, meaning that they should be conscious and they, have to, they should have the strength to breathe spontaneously and cough effectively because this is a method by which uh, we just control the pressure but we don't provide the breaths by the machine. Machine just controls the pressure. The patient themselves take the breath or they're in control of their breathing patterns. The commonest non-invasive ventilation that are used uh, that is used in COPD is BiPAP. BiPAP is elaborated as bi-level positive area pressure. It means there are two levels of positive area pressure, one for inspiration and one for expiration. For inspiration, the pressure is known as IPAP or inspiratory positive area pressure, IPAP. And this is capped up to a level of 10 centimeter water. The EPAP or expiratory positive area pressure is kept below and it's around 5 cm of water. The sudden advantages of BiPAP are improvement in ventilation, a decrease in work of breathing, and prevention of air trapping and dynamic hyperinflation. Those are the main pathophysiology that lies uh, in COPD. So those are the things that happen in COPD. And BiPAP reverses or partially reverses those important pathophysiologic events. When we uh, provide BiPAP, we should be careful to check the tidal volume because if the patient cannot maintain an appropriate tidal volume, then we should be concerned. And this should be around 5 to 8 milliliters per kg of ideal body weight. We should also look out for unintentional mask leak. Here is a a uh, common BiPAP setting. You can see that the straps connect the BiPAP mask to the face and it should be very tight. There should not be any leaks in any through any parts of the mask. And this is connected with a pressure controller or the BiPAP machine. And uh, sometimes BiPAP fails or BiPAP does not improve the situation. And when the partial pressure of carbon dioxide still rises despite receiving a certain amount or certain time of um, non-invasive ventilation and the pH falls to less than 7.26 which is a moderate amount of respiratory acidosis then we might consider intubation and mechanical ventilation but uh, this has certain disadvantages and that's why we have to um, take the decision involving multiple parties, which are the patient, the family, the seniors, and also ICU staff to before making a decision. And when we are uh, dealing the patient, we have to uh, provide those kind of options that the patient might need to have in the later times and we have to take concern of the patient at early times when the patient comes to the ED and receiving either high flow oxy uh, either oxygen through venturi mask or NIV. And we should take the concern if the patient uh, would like to have mechanical ventilation or not. Uh, the disadvantages are the ventilation is often very difficult to wean off. There are risk of ventilator associated pneumonia and pneumothorax due to ruptured bulla. As you know that COPD patients have, tend to have bullas which easily rupture due to the pressure from uh, the vent uh, ventilation leading to barotrauma and pneumothorax. That's all from me today. Thank you very much for watching.
please like my video and subscribe to my channel and suggest what can be done to improve the quality of my videos and what are the topics that you want more videos on thank you very much bye bye